Welcome to another episode of How I Killed My Mother. Before I begin this episode, the one where I'm going to tell you about the time me and my mom became best friends again, I want to tell you about another podcast. I have been obsessed with a podcast called Something Was Wrong. The host and originator of this highly rated and popular podcast has personal experience and empathy for people who were abused, wronged, catfished, gaslit by people they knew. The host created this podcast, Something Was Wrong, and it is an award-winning true crime docuseries about the discovery, trauma, and recovery from shocking life events and abusive relationships. I bring this podcast up to you because as I write each episode of How I Killed My Mother, I'm basically reviewing my own life as it relates to my mom. And when I have to edit each episode, um, when I edit episodes, I hear myself and I think, oh my God, am I a psychopath or a sociopath or a narcissist? And do I love Tiffany's podcast because I empathize with the perpetrators or the victims? Am I simply entertained, which would mean that I'm a creep? And I'm not going to go with the creep. One of my stupid jokes among friends is, if anyone brings up the topic of abusive relationships, I used to always say, I have been in so many abusive relationships and I've apologized to every one of them. Ha 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 ha, right? Not funny. If Tiffany ever listens to this podcast, she may not be amused. Certainly, she'd point out to me that abuse is not funny. And I agree. But laughter through tears is my favorite emotion. So for a minute, I'm going to let you think that I'm a woke sociopath, but only temporarily. Did I hurt a lot of people's feelings in my past? You betcha. I hurt a lot of feelings in my time, my mom's feelings included. I created a lot of feelings of resentment in countless sweet and sour hearts. Many times I heard the words, but you didn't have to say it like that and be so mean. And that was true. But I always nodded my point to home and I was a sore winner. It was nothing for me to brush off another person's feelings and I expected everyone to get over it. Control issues? Selfish? Cruel to be cool? Of course. And in much of my life, I saw no value of being anything else. But as I make each episode of How I Killed My Mother, I am reminded why I was the way I was and how much I have grown. So much of how I related to people and personal relationships were a direct result of me making the decision to be a winner at all costs. I became an overbearing controller because I thought that was better than letting someone else make decisions for me or be controlled or to be manipulated by someone else. And what a terrible way to go through life. Of course, I made those decisions for myself. It wasn't my mom did that to me or my dad did that to me. I just decided that's how I was going to be and I stuck with it. And as I've stated in my mind, I was being like my mom, the controller, and I rejected being like my dad, which I thought he was kind of weak. But I began to unlearn that controlling, untrusting, manipulative way of being in the years that my mom and I became friends again. And that's where getting into this episode. In that time, I learned everything I needed to know to be happy, giving, loving, and a spiritual person. I will admit that I didn't change overnight, and I still haven't benefited from every lesson I learned because old habits are really hard to unlearn. In fact, I think lifetimes are finite for a reason. You have only the one lifetime to unlearn your shit and learn how to be happy and giving and loving and a spiritual person. In other words, I'm still living and I'm still working on me. Um, Before I tell you um, or get into this week's tale, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and for no one will find this or discover this podcast if you don't give my podcast a little help, and I appreciate that. To know more about me or to find out where you can get my books, Mafia Hairdresser or The Glow Stick Gods, go to MafiaHairdresser.com, and don't forget to check out my true crime podcast, John David and Goliath, as well as the serial podcast version of Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods on this same podcast stream just scroll backwards. You're listening to How I Killed My Mother, the fourth podcast in the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. Now, on with this episode.
after the mafia hairdresser days, um, Chuck and I were really having a rough time. He moved out shortly to work on his sobriety, and I was working at John Dunn's Hair Designers in Long Beach, California. And I was unhappy. The young ladies whom I had been over-parenting had left. My mom and I were not that close, and I spent the hours I didn't work spying on Chuck at his apartment. Yeah, that was because I thought he was cheating on me, and we were on a break. And I never did catch him cheating on me. And then I began to work on myself. I told you that in high school, I was moderately popular and I may have come off as self-assured, but I secretly thought of myself as dumb. There's a reason for that. I was never taught English, so I skated by or cheated in a lot of my classes. Then when Chuck and I were separated, I read an LA Times article. The writer told of feeling dumb, as she had failed in high school in the same areas that I had also underachieved in. The writer and I were the exact same age. What happened to us, she explained, was that when we were in middle school and high school, our LA school district moved the teaching of sentence structure and the basics of English from one grade level to another. Those were the years between 1975 and 1980. At the time, there were thousands of us in that district who skipped grades or jumped into accelerated classes. Those individuals, like me, unwittingly missed being taught rudimentary sentence structure and the breakdown of the spoken or written word. By the time I graduated from high school in 1980, I had no idea what a verb was or a noun or a predicate phrase. The black hole in my education was responsible for making me think that English and writing were not for me. But after I read that article, I took public television courses on the TV at a certain time, and I took these courses in English and sentence structure, and a writer was born. By the time Chuck moved back in with me, I had my first column byline in an Orange County magazine, and I had also begun studying screenwriting, and I began the script Mafia Hairdresser. This is long before the book. And later, I wrote several scripts, selling one and adapting another, which became a hit sellout play in Chicago. But while I was still a young man in Long Beach, as I began to use my brain writing, I also began to feel like a confident and competent adult. I did not give much time to fighting with my mother or trying to control my boyfriend as much because I was learning so much more than being just a hairdresser or someone's boyfriend or angry or mean or manipulative. In fact, I wrote a business plan. I owned my own salon and employed up to 19 staff members at the age of 24. Now, I was a very good hair artist, but I wrote an excellent business plan, and I was very natural at marketing. The business model I had for my salon was to do lots of marketing and pay my stylist a salary. I would handle getting the customers to the stylist, and they'd be making money the minute they started working for me. No slowly trying to build up a clientele and starving while improving their skills. But I would require them to improve their skills with education and I would pay for that and I would provide that. The business plan was a huge success. Within six months of opening, everyone in Long Beach, California and beyond knew about Visage Appearance Center. And I know that's really bad um, French. It's like saying Appearance Appearance Center. But we were located in the the, uh, new downtown redevelopment part of the city of Long Beach. And my business was more than a success in terms of being the busiest and buzziest salon in town. It brought me and my family closer together. By the way, half the money came from the bank to open this business and half of it came from my severance money from the mafia hairdresser days. Anyway, dad could not been have more prouder of me at that time. I will tell you it was lovely. He had sold his service stations and was sort of in between what he was deciding to do when he grew up. He was way too young to retire and I was not the best uh, people managers. Dad loved working with my staff along with Diana, the full-time manager, who we're good friends again today. And I didn't like working as a manager. I was not diplomatic, as you may well have heard from past episodes, but I liked training them, but I didn't work next to them so much. 
I even made the clientele that I had built up at John Don's Hair Designers go to my staff for their hair services while I went to Chamber of Commerce meetings. I got myself on TV and I wrote articles for women's magazines and stuff like that so that I could keep my salon top of mind for anyone who needed hair, skin, and body services in Southern California. So, you know, I put my arm in a sling for like six months whenever I was in public. So I would tell my clients that I was coming back to work, but I never went back to work doing hair in my own hair salon the whole time, almost the whole time I worked there. Anyway, dad also did the payroll and he also booked all of our group presentations and group presentations were part of the um, marketing component of my business model. At the time, Color Me Beautiful and seminars on skincare and in-salon lessons on how to blow dry your hair and how to tie scarves and home product knowledge and self-body care, that was all new. So my dad would book me and a few of my hairstylists and facialists and massage therapists in the lunch hour of the hospital nurses and doctors or hotel staff or lawyer's office, as well as big companies and small companies so that we could teach them these free models in front of their staff members. I had already by this time been trained as a speaker. I was a platform artist and I was a hair educator, but I just flipped it and began educating the public instead of professionals with my staff doing the work on the stage behind me. And if I spoke in 25 people um, watching my staff perform hair, skin, and body miracles on a few volunteer participants, and they did that behind me as I spoke, we got 20 new customers. And think about this. When the 20 new customers came into my salon for five appointments per year at an average of $80 per appointment, that's $8,000 a year that salon would gross. That was good marketing. I was learning a lot, like I was too young to manage people at 24, and I spent way too much money, the working capital, on the very best equipment and the very best products when I should have let the business build up first to merit that. But dad loved helping me, and he really had a good time at Visage. He liked that he could buy nice clothes and nice shoes and ties, and he was a dapper guy, and he would wear them without getting gas, grease, or oil on them all day. And he always was great at schmoozing at the many, many, many cocktail parties for the Downtown Business Association or the Long Beach Chamber of Commerce that I had to attend that he also attended. I may have been the face of the Saj Appearance Center, but business people in Long Beach and Southern California soon came to know that my dad was the one who actually put my face and business out there. One time, the mayor of Long Beach, Ernie Kell, walked up to my dad at a cocktail party and he says, hello, John, it's nice to see you. Dad and I were both at this mixer and I think it was for the Pine Avenue Merchants Association, an organization that me along with three other 24-year-olds and a 48-year-old restaurateur formed when we realized that the Long Beach Downtown Business Association was too old school for us to help it build um, the redevelopment area the way we knew that we could do it. Anyway, when Ernie Cal walked up to my dad, he did not know I was very near both of them and I could hear everything they both said. It's nice to see you too, Mayor Kell, said my father. The new downtown is shaping up very nicely thanks to the new businesses opened by the young people like your son, said Mayor Kell. They really had a great vision. My dad said, they're doing a great job and working very hard. Yes, they are. Say, John, there's something I want to ask you. And my dad says, sure. What is it like to have a gay son? And without hesitation, my dad said, well, I'm proud of my son. He's opened his own business and he's helping his community. And I'm happy to be able to help him. I thought you'd say something like that, said Marikel. And I like your answer, John. Listeners, can you imagine what that does for a son or a daughter when they hear a parent tell someone without hesitation that they are proud of them? It changes you. You've made it. You've accomplished a life goal that is infused in every child's DNA at birth. Real heartfelt parental approval. 
I know good parents say they're proud of their children, but when a child, in my case, me as an adult, hears it and really gets that your parents are truly proud of you, it makes you feel so thankful that you've worked as hard as you did to achieve that statement of significance in your parents' eyes. My dad and I may have had our differences, but they all faded away when I heard him tell the mayor of the fourth largest city in California that he was proud of me. As an aside, and I do many asides, I believe that no matter who you are, if you do the work hard and you do the best you can and be your authentic self, people will see that. And some of those people may be your sworn enemy. They may hate you because you're different. You're a different color. You're gay. You're trans. Or you're a different religion than they are. But when they see you work and you're doing your best that you possibly can, they might just change their mind about hating someone like you. And you may never know it. That same Mayor Kell attended one of the Long Beach Chamber of Commerce mixers that I organized. It was a drag performance group and they were at a gay club called Ripples. Yeah, I managed to get the Chamber of Commerce to have a mixer there. And even after he was the mayor, he attended the second AIDS walk ever. And that was because I was on the committee for that in Long Beach, California. I believe Mayor Cal gave me and those events his endorsement by showing up because he thought I was an okay dude, as well as that statement that my dad said to him years before, I'm proud of my son. That makes me choked up just talking about it. Ugh. Anyway, ugh. before my salon was open, me, dad, my grandfather, my contractor, and construction crews had to build walls. We had to punch holes for skylights, hang these cool pendant tube lightings that were new, and install hair stations, hang giant mirrors, plaster, and paint, and run plumbing and electrical on my Pine Avenue Long Beach location. And my mom was also always there. She helped with everything. In fact, being one of the most handy and arty people anyone could ever know, mom would climb the 30-foot scaffold to paint the inside of the skylight, something no one would have done. Not even the pros. It's just too high and scary. My mom was not scared of anything. She managed the contractors and the crews, and she chose the colors for my salon, as well as made the seat covers for the chairs. Um, she made a canopy that draped over the retail cosmetic counter that was installed. And mom became the buyer for all the accessories in my salon, such as clothing, jewelry belts, and hair ornaments, the entire time I owned that hair salon. And in that first year of owning my salon, mom and I still had a chill between us. But she began to at least try to accept Chuck, if only as far as the man who was in my life that didn't seem to go away. She learned how to be cordial with him when their paths crossed at my hair salon, but there were no dinners or anything like that. I had decided to visit my grandma, Delia Lopez, in Northern California. She was my mom's mom, and she was tiny, feisty, funny, and she was a Mexican woman who made her own tortillas, who loved scolding, nurturing, and smothering her grandchildren with love. She was getting up in years and had told me over the phone to get my butt up to Antioch in the Bay Area and to visit her. So in that first year of my business, I needed a break, so I planned to take Chuck with me. He had never met her, nor many of my aunts or uncles or cousins. He had met my grandma and grandpa Elsher, uh, my dad's parents, and since they lived in the same area as my grandma Delia, we'd of course visit them as well as we were going to stay at their house because they had extra bedrooms. When mom found out that trip to see my family was with Chuck in tow, she forbade it. I had not anticipated that she would have any opinion on my trip, especially since she had been tolerating Chuck whenever she she saw him at Visage Appearance Center. But I had a very short and terse response to her forbidding me and my boyfriend visiting my own family. I'm going, I said, and Chuck is going with me. And there's nothing you can do about that. And Chuck and I went to Antioch, California. And we hung out with my grandma and my cousins and their kids. And we stayed with my white grandparents. And no one had a problem with it. 
again, did I tell you I have a gay uncle, Uncle Joey, he's passed his um, husband, my Uncle Steve is still alive. But he, Uncle Joey was crazy 70s and 60s gay. He was like that super gay, the marching, funny gay. And he would say things in any room about trans, gay, up the butt stuff. Nothing like me. And I just don't understand, even to this day, how my mom, well, whatever, I'm moving on. Anyway, all of my mom's family knew who Chuck was to me, and they had no problem with it. So when we came back home, mom had to get with it more, I think, and she began to warm up to Chuck. If her family and my dad's family didn't think that there was anything bad about John David having a boyfriend, really, why should she? Because I had a very visible small business in a big city, my world and responsibilities got bigger. I attended a lot of events. I schmoozed. um, And I was the face of a salon that needed to stay visible because of my business model. Conversely, my boyfriend Chuck, his world was getting smaller. He began in earnest to quit drinking, which began a lot of needed alone and introspection time. In other words, he really couldn't be with me out and about around town. But his reflections did help him begin to form the idea that he wanted to be a teacher. And in my opinion at the time, and I had strong opinions, I thought that he would have been wasting his brilliant IQ mind by teaching when he could make millions doing anything else because he was so smart. My opinions, his reflections, my business, and his self-nurturing all combined with other factors to break us up after eight years together. One of my biggest regrets about that is that I know my mother would have come to love Chuck had we stayed together. I would have liked to, but I never talked about Chuck to my mother, especially about the whys of when we called it quits. I probably blamed her a little bit for the breakup, but that wouldn't have been fair or true. I think Chuck and I got together and we stuck together in our first years because in part, because I wanted to spite my mother. And I never talked to her about him because I thought she was always ashamed of me being gay. So I certainly wasn't ever going to tell her about Chuck's addictions. To her, drugs and alcohol were just as much the tools of the devil as homosexuality. My mom continued to be a bitch to me. Much like I couldn't and wouldn't support Chuck when he said he wanted to be a teacher because I hung on to my controlling ways and I hung on to my resentments for his drinking and I hung on to my grudges and suspicions against him. Mom was like that to me. Yes, she helped me in my hair salon. And yes, we still did holidays and birthdays and such. But whether I baked and brought a cake for her birthday, or showed up in a suit for her anniversary dinners, or took time out of my weekends to help dad put tiles on their roof, the cake would be the wrong flavor. Or it looked like I gained 10 more overweight pounds in my now too small for me suit. Or it was a shame I didn't come to put the tiles on the roof before it rained. I never knew when the zingers would come, but mom always knew what to say to make me feel like shit. One of the worst times was when my grandfather died. My mom really loved him. Uh, My grandpa, Elsher, was her father-in-law, and he taught her how to use skill saws, a hammer and nails, sheetrocking, plastering, and more. And he was so proud of all the things she did around the house I grew up in, which included rescreening and pouring the cement for our patio and stuff like that. They had a special bond. A few days after Grandpa's funeral, my mom was downstairs at Grandma Elsher's home in Northern California. And mom was helping my grandma organize and sort things of my grandpa's to possibly give away to me, my brother or my cousins or whomever. When my mom called me, I went downstairs and I saw piles of things like fly fishing reels, engineering tools, maps, camping equipment, and even guns placed carefully in different piles around the room. The mom said to me, is there anything you want of your grandfather's? I looked at everything around the room, the piles. I was about to say, let me think about it because I didn't need any more tools. I wasn't an engineer. I didn't camp. I certainly didn't fish and I didn't shoot. That's not to say I didn't learn how to do all of those things for my grandpa. I just didn't find the time for those things in my adult life, and I didn't foresee a time when I would have time or would want to build something, measure something, camp, fish, or shoot. But then I spied an orange, sparkly, round plexiglass paperweight that always sat on my grandfather's desk. I loved holding it and looking into it as a child. I always imagined it was a magical crystal ball because it had gold glitter in it. 
And it always reminded me of my grandpa and his achievements in his life, one of which was to receive that paperweight for years of service as a safety engineer at the Antioch Dow Chemical Plant. The paperweight had the Dow emblem floating in the middle of it. I thought that paperweight was the best memento of my grandfather that I could ever wish for. Everything else he had given me was inside of me. All of those skills, fishing and engineering and building stuff. All of those experiences together were part of me already. Grandpa would always be a part of who I was. And that paperweight would just always remind me of everything we were together. So I picked up the paperweight and said to my mother, I would love this. It reminds me of grandpa and I have always loved it. Oh, John David, declared Grandma. I think that is just perfect. You always used to talk to that orange paperweight, and you held it, and you made wishes on it. Grandma really got it. But then my mom snatched it out of my hand and said, But what if your brother wants it? Did you ever think of that? I was shocked. And my grandmother was shocked, I think. I didn't even have a moment to see what Grandma thought of my mom's cruel snap repost. My tears of shock and the confusing feelings of hurt, embarrassment, and confound were gurging up in my body, and I ran out the back door so that when they surfaced and spilled out of me, I would be far away from my mother. I hadn't been crying or heaving that long before my mom followed me out the door. She didn't hug me at first, but she apologized. She told me that she didn't know why she did that to me, and she gave the only excuse that she thought was the right one. And that was, she just felt so sad that Grandpa had passed and that it made her take it out on me. And of course, I could have that paperweight. <sighs> but I knew why she lashed out at me. It was for the years that we were mad at each other. It was for the years I lied. It was for making her hang around that boyfriend she wanted out of my life. And it was for growing up and being successful and going to visit her family with that bad boyfriend that she forbade me to do it. This wasn't the last straw for me. But the next time something like that happened, I was going to put my foot down. My relationship with my mom was becoming intolerable from just being tolerable, which we had been to each other for over eight years. We we're just tolerable. Her old opinions, my reflections, my business, and my self-nurturing were combining to break up the way we were going to relate to each other in the near future, which was just about the same combination that broke up me and Chuck. The straw that did break the camel's back was when I flew up to Antioch from Long Beach to attend a cousin's wedding. My parents had driven and I was going to ride back with them to Southern California. It was on the way home that mom began to take her jabs at me. It was like a seven hour drive and mom must have been saving up some angst for me because by the time we stopped to get gas about halfway home in a little town called Buttonwillow, Central California, I dashed out of the car from the back seat and I said, I have to pee. Then I ran. Just as I was washing my hands in the men's room, my dad walked in. Hey, laddie, he said. <sighs> I said, boy, mom is really going for my throat today, isn't she? What are you talking about? He said, Dad, I sighed. And then I began to break into a few tears, which confused him. You see, Dad was always a little blind to when Mom would buy into me verbally. He thought I was strong. And over the years, he just accepted that Mom and me were just that way. But what he missed was that I had stopped fighting back. I stopped poking at her the way she continued to poke at me. And that made me mad. So that car ride was what pushed me to decide what I had already decided that I was going to do. When I got back into that car, I informed my mom and my dad that I would no longer visit them at their home. And there would be no more birthdays, no more holidays, nor would I attend any more family events with them unless we were all a family in counseling together. And I really thought my mother would agree to that. I believe that she thought we had already begun to become closer again through these uh, years that I owned my hair salon. And after all, she had endorsed, no, she ordered me to go to a family counselor only less than a decade before. Why would she refuse? But refuse, she did. But my dad did agree to go with me. And we grew even closer. And sadly for my mother, our closeness, my dad's and mine, and her refusal to go to therapy with us nearly cost my mom her marriage. 
Since dad and I worked together in Long Beach for my salon and my mom refused to go, we decided to go to a Long Beach counselor. Her name was Judy Doyle. In the first three or four weeks of counseling, Judy Doyle heard a lot of dumping where it concerned my mom, both uh, from me and my dad. And I had a lot of resentment for my mom, and so did my dad. And Judy illuminated my part and my dad's part in our own relationships with my mother. But hearing my dad talk about my mom as a wife really blew my mind. He resented her controlling, and he saw it when it came to himself, not me. And he felt ashamed for letting her convince him to side with her in that time when she was trying to make me straight, because he never had a problem with me being gay. So he was mad at her for that, and I was just forgiving, if not flabbergasted. He told that story in front of me, and we became close, I said. But we even learned how to hug and express our feelings with each other, which is a bonus for a son and a father. These skills, these communication skills, we did not have these between us before. Dad had a lot of other resentments towards my mom that I had no idea existed. At the time we began counseling, my mom was trying to convince my dad that they should have another baby. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was shocked. The anger that was coming out in those sessions with Judy Doyle, just for me, was making me hate my mom more than I ever hated her before. And hearing dad's angst against her and hearing that my mom wanted to have another kid when dad had just sold his service stations and was helping me out in my business seemed ludicrous. My mom was a fucking bitch and she was fucking crazy. And when my dad was expressing that he might not want to be in any relationship with my mom any longer, I was the first to scream, divorce her. But then around, let's say, our fourth or fifth sessions, things began to change. Judy Doyle had given me and my dad weekly assignments so that we could learn how to be better communicators with each other and how to look at and figure out and focus on what we wanted out of the rest of our own respective lives. He for him and me for me. Once the anger and the topic of my mom began to not be the main emphasis of the sessions, that is when Judy Doyle posed the few questions to my father and me that unlocked the box of mature life tools that both me and my dad and I sorely needed. Now, I'd like to ask you two gentlemen why you wanted to bring Marie, your wife, John, and your mother, John David, to these sessions said Judy Doyle. It seems like you two have really gotten a lot out of these sessions without her. Yeah, I said, I, I feel really better about everything, about mom and me and my dad have never been closer. And my dad agreed. He even stated that things at home with my mom seemed much better as well. I think in my mind, I was still thinking he should divorce her. And I would have said so later when we were together in my salon office, if the extra brother or extra sister subject ever came up again outside of the Judy Doyle office sessions. Good, good. Excellent, said Judy Doyle. Now, if you could just answer the question, what was the reason you two wanted to bring Marie Elsher to these counseling sessions for? I was like, ooh, I raised my hands, trying to be cheeky. I know, I know, I said. I wanted her to know how much she hurt me. I wanted her to hear all the things I told you about her so she would know that she was horrible to me. And you, John, said Judy Doyle, nodding matter of fact and facing my father. Well, said Dad, a humming. I wanted her to be here so that she could have learned how to better communicate with me, like John David and I have done here. I would have liked to express to her how much what she says to me hurts me. In other words, said Judy Doyle, you wanted to drag her here so you both could rub her nose in everything you think she did to both of you. Bingo, I said. I would have loved that. I would have loved to see my mother squirm as I told her what a rotten, evil, conniving, lying bitch she was when she made me go to a shrink and then threatened me with shock treatments and then kicked me out of the house, not to mention all the years of calling me fat, telling me I wasn't good enough, and warning me that the other shoe was always going to drop, and not those exact words over the last nine years. What a fucking projecting bitch. My dad didn't say anything. He was older and wiser, and he knew what Judy Doyle was getting at. 
Let me ask both of you boys another thing," said Judy Doyle in a very serious tone. "Let's say your wife and mother had come to these sessions, and you rubbed her nose and all of those things you have against her, and she tells you she's sorry. What then? What exactly do you want to see as far as a relationship with each of you individually with Marie after these sessions are completed?" I would like to love my wife again," said my dad. "Oh," I said, unsure at first. What my dad had just said really set a tone, you know. I guess I would just want me and my mom to be close again, except I don't want her to pick on me anymore. Well then, men," said Judy Doyle. "Do that." But I pointed out, my mom wasn't here. She didn't hear me. She didn't get to hear what I said. Judy Doyle looked at me and rolled her eyes, as she had seen me do many times when I extolled how awful my mother was. Of course, she wasn't here. She said, "She's not stupid. You two were going to ambush her so that you could feel better by throwing shit in her face. She's smart, and I admire her for that. But what you two ding dongs don't realize is that you already let all that anger and resentment out in this room, and you two have learned how to be a better communicator." Each of you. So I'm telling you, go home and make that new relationship with Marie that you want to have with her. She didn't need to hear how bad or mean or conniving she was with both of you. She knows that. And if you stop trying to make her apologize for it, or rub her nose in it, pay for it, maybe one day she will apologize. If you both let go of everything in the past and start living with her now, live with her the way you want it to be in the future, you'll be giving her a reason to apologize. John, you'll be giving her a husband who loves her enough to forgive, and John David, you'll be giving her a son who needs and loves his mother. Two things worth keeping and apologizing in the future for. And that was that. Brilliant. And new, and I didn't believe that would work at first when I started to do it. But when I went home that day from that particular session, I, per homework, began to visualize what kind of relationship I wanted with my mother, and then I started doing it with her. I hugged my mother when I greeted her, and I hugged her before I left to go home. After I began to take her out to dinners and movies, just the two of us. At first, when she made a snide comment like "I wonder what you're up to," I would say things like "You better get used to it." And after a while, when she might say things like "I put on a few pounds," or "You can do anything you set your mind to, John David, just don't get your hopes up too high," then I would always come back politely and say, "Mom, when you say things like that to me, it hurts my feelings, and I'm sorry if I had ever said anything like that to you." Please tell me if I ever hurt your feelings, because I don't like it when my feelings get hurt. Or I would say, I would have never made it this far if I hadn't got my hopes up too high, Mom. And you're the one who taught me how to fly. And so it began with a little ripple, a lot of actions, small, quiet, loving words. My mother and I began to walk through the rest of our lives with each other as friends. But you know what? I'm the one who changed. And I did not try and change my mother, and she changed. So when years later she brought up the time she forced me to come out, the shrink sessions, the lying years, and even her angst towards Chuck, and she apologized to me for that time, I nearly laughed. You see, I had long ago forgiven her for that shit, and I thought I had forgiven myself for my part in that stuff as well. But the near laugh came out because it was as if she was talking about something that. I would have loved for her to apologize for years before, but when she did it, it did not matter to me at all. It was nothing. I loved my mom when she said I was sorry, honey. I don't know what that was about, but all I could think of to do was hug my mom. I hoped that she knew that we had so much love between us that there was nothing to be sorry for. But I do want her to know now that I think I understand both her and myself more, and that we would have not have become who we were or are if things had not been done the way we did them, right or wrong. And I think I've said this in a different way before. I'm not sure the point of living is always to be right. Sometimes you're wrong and you hurt people you love, and it's what you do after you realize the horror that you've inflicted that is the most important.
I have to leave you with a very touching story that was part of that time that we healed each other after the sessions with Judy Doyle. I lived in Chicago at the time, and I was at home alone and single, and I watched a TV movie called um, Twilight of the Golds. Twilight of the Golds was not a superhero movie or a vampire flick, or it was not the story of a prominent Jewish family before the Holocaust. It was about a grown gay man whose sister and her husband, a doctor, had the access to a fictional genetic testing that could reveal if their unborn baby had the DNA of a gay. In the movie, the gay man's whole family, including his own parents, deals with the ramifications of asking the questions. What if we found out our fetus was going to be gay? What if we only thought we would have a straight child? Wouldn't having a straight child be easier on the child? On us? Would we abort our baby if we knew there was a chance that he, she, they would be gay, lesbian, or different than straight? The gay brother's sister and her doctor husband take the gay pre-reveal test on their unborn baby. The sister, played by Jennifer Beals, then decides at first to go along with her doctor husband's desire to abort the baby when they find out their child would probably be born gay. In this movie, even the gay brother, played by Brandon Fraser, struggles with how he feels about his sister's situation. Even he wonders if he would have existed at all if his own mother, played by Faye Dunaway, could have found out if he was gay in the womb. If testing could reveal the sexual orientation of your unborn child and you knew he or she would be gay, would you abort? That's the film's question, and I'm pretty sure most people would immediately answer no. But in 1997, when I saw that movie, we Americans had just experienced more than a decade of the AIDS epidemic. There were riots and marches and demonstrations, and they still continued well into 1997. Gay marriage was just short of two more decades away, and LGBT didn't even have a cue. So Americans didn't yet believe in their hearts that it was really okay to be gay. I will tell you, I bawled after I watched that Showtime movie back in 1997. And after I composed myself, I immediately called my mom. As I said, she was my touchstone for everything. I had been living in Chicago for five years by that time, and my mom and dad still lived in California. I was missing my mom, and I had just begun to feel guilty for choosing to live so far away. At the time, I seemed to be perpetually single. I was a successful hairdresser. Again, I was writing, and I had a few successes on that plane. And I had been acting in plays and was producing as well. And my parents weren't travelers, so it was just all me and for me. So I was sad that they didn't get to see all that stuff I was doing. Anyway, there was so much more I wanted to do in my life, and I was trying to do it all in Chicago. And yet, that movie triggered all the facets in my own life in my mind where I felt I could have done better. Why hadn't I sold my mafia hairdresser screenplay already? Why hadn't I gotten a book published yet? And why didn't I get the part in the play I wanted? And why was I perpetually single? Whenever things were good or bad in my life, mom was always the first one I wanted to talk to, and I just had to talk to her about that movie. I wanted to ask her if she knew that I was gay when I was still in her womb, would she have aborted me? I remembered how she worried when I was in my first gay parade in the 80s. She thought someone would shoot me. That didn't start till the 2000s. And then I remembered when she found out I was gay and what she said about my boyfriend, and that she was going to have the gay electrocuted out of me. And then there was the fact that I wasn't the easiest or the best of sons as a child. And then, of course, I dashed her dreams of me getting married and having babies because I was a proud homosexualist. Before she answered the phone, I'd have bet she would have most certainly aborted me had she had the chance. It would have been so much easier to have had a straight boy instead of a gay one like me. When mom picked up the phone, I told mom all about the movie and how it moved me, but I skirted around the big affecting part of the movie for me. But she knew what I was getting at. Are you asking me if I have any regrets that you're gay? She asked. I choked and I nodded on the phone. Oh, honey, she cooed. I wouldn't change any part of you or what you and I went through together. I love you just the way you are. 
This was long after that initial apology I mentioned before. This was something new. It was not an apology. It was the same thing happened when my dad told the mayor of Long Beach that he was proud of me. I heard it and I felt it. My mom loved me and she was proud of me and I was proud of both of us. Thank you for listening. In next week's episode of How I Killed My Mother, you're going to hear about How I Killed My Mother.